I would like to welcome all of you for joining us for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. As you can see from the screen, this is a power week, and we are thrilled to have William Schwab with us today, CPA and Philadelphia manager with your part-time controller. William is joining us today to talk about bankers in your boat and establishing banking relationships. So we are excited to have this conversation with you. We are also thrilled to have the continued support of our presenting sponsors. Many of these companies have been with us from the beginning, almost 400 episodes now, and they exist for one purpose, and that purpose is to help you do more good. So they are in your community. Many of them are virtual now, of course, and they really are here to help drive your mission forward, including your part-time controller that joins us for this Power Week today. So thank you for that. And of course, thank you to Julia Patrick, who has joined us as the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. If it weren't for Julia, we wouldn't be having this Power Week. Um, just like many of you, we thought this would last about a couple of weeks, and here we are coming up on two years. I'm Jarrett Ransom. I get the great privilege to sit beside Julia and uh, play this co-host, and it's been such a great journey. I'm also known as the Nonprofit Nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And again, this week, it is dedicated, very significant, that every single episode is dedicated to your part-time controller. We're calling it Power Week. So hashtag power up and uh, really looking forward to this conversation with you, William. I'd like to welcome you. Thank you so much. It is such a, a pleasure to, to be here. And I know, uh, you know, all of us at, at YPTC are, are so excited to be partnering with you for this for this week. Really, really looking forward to it. Jen, uh, Jen's session yesterday was great. Uh, spoiler alert, I think I'll probably have some carryover because we're talking about banking, right? So uh, some of those fraud topics we touched on yesterday, um, they, they're they connected to cash, right? So that ties right over into the relationships you have with your bankers and the services that your bank is providing to you. So I'm really glad you brought this up because I think in the nonprofit sector, a lot of times we think, oh, we don't need a banker. That's for profit. That's with lots of money. We're just like doing the minimum and we don't need this. But I think that's just not true. Oh, I'd, yeah, I'd say it's absolutely uh, not true. If, if anything, probably nonprofits have uh, more of a need to have to have that relationship, that that good, strong relationship with 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 a banker. Um, you know, especially you know, let's 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 think back over you know over the the events that have been unfolding over over the past year and a half as we've dealt with COVID. Um, you know, so many of our clients, uh, you know, were able to to make use of PPP loans. And where did you have to go to a, get a PPP loan? You had to go to a bank. And if you, you know, if if you didn't have, uh, you know, kind of a a contact or someone you could talk to at at your bank, if you were just a a random number calling into to a call center, you you might have been left out in the cold in terms of trying to get in for for some of the PPP funding. I think you are so right. And you hit the nail on the head, William. We have talked so much over these now almost 400 episodes about the return on relationship mm -hmm. and really the investment. We talk often, and I'm sure you do too, as you know, being in the accounting industry, that return on investment, but we rarely talk about that return on relationship. And during such tumultuous times, really having that banker and a banking relationship um, helped so many of us, including the nonprofit sector, right? Small businesses, nonprofit sector, really everyone. Um, and you're right. I mean, really having that relationship because I went through those applications. I know Jennifer joined us, Jennifer Oliva joined us from YPTC often, often on Fridays as well, as she was literally live getting the updates on her phone. And there was so many, you know, so many changes. So tell us, you know, how do we, how do we go about finding a banker and uh, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it can take a variety of, of forms. Um, and I think, you know, what, what I've seen for a, a lot of our clients and, and again, uh, you know, for, for the benefit of, 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 of your audience, of course, you know, I'm, I'm one of our Philadelphia managers, so I'm, I'm based here in Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to, to what I know some of my clients have, have experienced, but I suspect 
the stories are the same uh, throughout the country is, uh, you know, a lot of what might have been, uh, you know, smaller or, you know, community banks have, have, have gotten gobbled up over the years in, in terms of, in terms of mergers. So uh, I know I speak for one client where, uh, you know, they, you know, for years knew who the branch manager was in, in their office that was, you know, only, you know, a, a half a mile down the road from, from where my client was. But then, of course, through through a series of mergers and you know name changes, all of all of those familiar faces uh, disappeared. So, um, you know, we uh, you know for this client in particular, but I know a lot of my other clients and, and a lot of other YPTC clients uh, as well have have really looked to um, you know some of the uh, you know the community banks that still exist that are still out there. Um, in many cases, they are. Um, you know, setting up, uh, you know, nonprofit, I'll call them practice line, but, but nonprofit, you know, nonprofit service lines just to service the nonprofit sector. Um, the client that I mentioned, um, they're, a, uh, they're an animal rescue organization. So they got connected with, uh, with a community bank where it turns out the president of that bank shares those same passions and interests. So not only did they find a great business partner. They also now found a great funding partner as well for someone who's going to support the mission, volunteer at their events, and and really just um, provide fantastic PR to the organization. And and I think those those are the success stories, and and they're definitely out there. So I have a one on one question. I'm a little embarrassed to ask it. Is a community bank the same as a credit union, or how do you define those two? They they are different, um, and I don't. Again, I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not not a lawyer in that regards in terms sure. of, of how the how the legal structure works. Um, but a credit union, um, you know, is typically set up. Uh, you know, they're they're kind of chartered differently in terms of how they're set up. Um, a community bank um, generally is is going to be a business. You know, they're going to have shareholders, whereas in a credit union. Um, the the owners are the members of that bank. There are no external shareholders. So that's that's the difference. And I think that's why you see, um, you know, credit unions in that regard, I think, have, have, have certainly become a lot more prevalent in recent years in the sense that, um, you know, they, they, you know, they, they market that, hey, we're, you know, we don't have shareholders, right? We're looking out, our members are our shareholders, we're looking out for them and, and putting their interests first. So that community bank is really vested in just that, the community. And so mm-hmm. finding, as you just said, I would call it a success story, this win-win of, you know, the leadership of the bank has a vested interest in this community solution, then really fits that alignment when it comes to mission mission match, as we call it. Um, And I think that really helps to build a very substantial relationship. It it absolutely does. And it builds those personal relationships too. You know, one, you know, I've asked my, you know, we're having these conversations with my clients, you know, a question that I will ask them sometimes, you know, especially if they're not happy with the service they're getting for their bank, you know, uh, very often a question I'll ask them is, well, when's the last time your bank reached out to you? You know, do you have the branch manager's phone number, cell number? You know, who do you talk to? You know, when you call them, are you talking to the same person or are you just a number in the queue and in their call center? And and that's really the difference in terms of the service. (laughs) So, Bill, I'm really curious, like if we can find a bank and I'm all about the community bank, I think that's such an important part of an actual um, societal structure within a community, because those investments stay in our communities. Those, those leaders know about the communities and sometimes they make decisions based on the relationships, on what exactly what Jarrett said, that return on relationship and not just a piece of paper. So I think it goes deeper and I'll step off my soapbox to ask you this question. When you talk about the service lines, what is it that we should be looking for in terms of partnering or giving our business to a bank? Sure. Um, well, I mean, any, um, you know, any bank is probably going to have, you know, relatively, you know, f- similar services, right? But there definitely are some, some specific ones that, that you want to be on the lookout for. 
And many of the ones I'm going to mention, you know, because for years we've always, you know, and, and this is something, you know, we've we've always, uh, you know, preached to, to our staff here at YPTC. It's like, you know, we're always we're always on the lookout for making recommendations to our clients. You know, we never want to rest on our laurels. There's always ways that that we can improve and, and help our clients improve, too. So even before. Uh, even before COVID and, and all of us working remotely, um, you know, we were always recommending to our clients, um, you know, be on the lookout for, um, you know, using, you know, if, if your bank offers some sort of remote deposit service, take advantage to that. So you're not wasting time driving back and forth to, to the bank branch. You know, those, those checks come in, you can essentially deposit them the, the same day rather than keeping them in a drawer somewhere. You know, we've had new clients where we've walked into it and they're like, oh yeah, here's our, you know, and you got a month's worth of, of deposits and and heaven forbid cash that hasn't been deposited um, you know so uh, you know so certainly remote deposit is huge um, online bill pay and that can take a variety of forms but certainly that's become critical um, you know working working remotely um, positive pay you know we talked you know Jennifer Oliva talked about uh, you know some some fraud issues yesterday in terms of ACH and wire fraud and check fraud um, and having um, you know positive pay where you're essentially telling the bank, here are the list of valid checks and the amounts. And if, if a check gets presented that doesn't match that check number or that amount, don't cash it because it's not, it's not a legitimate check. And, and a lot of a lot of organizations don't don't take advantage of that. And it's 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 a huge, huge uh, enhancement to your internal control structure. Okay, no wait, I have not heard of that. Now I'm old, so there there you go. But what what this looks like when you describe it to me, you're you're taking your chart of accounts and your register, you're you're plugging them in, and then you're also dovetailing that information to the financial institution. And if it doesn't match up. Yep. then it's kicked out. So so basically what you do, and now this is an organization if you're still issuing paper checks. Now, of course, I know we talked about yesterday, let's get away from paper checks wherever possible. But if you are, adding positive pay is a great enhancement. So for example, it'll say, okay, I issued check number um, one, two, three, four to Julia Patrick today for a hundred dollars, right? Oh so, no, uh, higher, higher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly he missed some zeros, but yeah. yeah. So, so if a check is presented that doesn't match that amount, that check number, that payee, the bank will, will, will automatically reject it because it's presumed to be fraudulent because we've seen that, you know, we've seen, I have, unfortunately I have a, a client here in Philadelphia where I think twice in the last three years, they've been the subject of, of check fraud where, uh, you know, a, a con artist has, has gotten a hold of their account information, which unfortunately is not that difficult to do and essentially creates fake checks that are then drawn on the bank account of the organization. So, um, you know, we've had to close accounts, move them, you know, we're, we're uh, moving them. They're actually in the process uh, this week of, of moving to an online uh, bill pay platform, which we've been asking them to do for years. And once and for all, this will put that, that issue to rest. So... <laughs> You know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I have had that happen to me before, Bill, where I sent a check and it was deposited multiple times via mobile deposit. And I was like, how can this happen? It's the same check, it's the same check number. So having this positive pay, I can imagine for an organization, because um, many of our viewers and many of our nonprofit, you know, um, participants here are really at that, you know, million dollar plus, mm -hmm. some $25 million plus. So we're talking some big checks, well above a hundred, <laughs> but yeah, some really big checks. And uh, so that's there, you know, and I think also technology has allowed so many individuals that have um, kind of like that ill will, if you if you will, it allows them to do even more harm. It's almost like, you know, these individuals that have that, that brilliant brain are able to think beyond the technology advancement. So that's why having, having a banker in your boat is so critical to the success and sustainability of your organization. Um, I can only imagine, you know, having, having a, a relationship so that when you know something's gone awry, actually your banker is, is the one to say, hey, Bill, did you notice this? This is a little out of, out of pattern, if you will. And I think that's, that's important. What about, you know, when it comes to cultivating these relationships, um, in particular, perhaps with these community bankers, Bill, 
how, how do you go about cultivating the relationship? And, and I'd like to ask a little deeper question, like how deep does this cultivation go? And I'm curious if we even ask them to join our board or committees, like how do we really engage with the bank? Yep. Yeah, I think it absolutely, um, you know, I would say it, it absolutely can go as far as, as you would want to take it. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned board, you know, board, board seats. And I certainly have had clients where, you know, a, a member of, of, of their bank and, and, and the individual they've, they've built a relationship with, um, you know, is, is serving on the board, certainly being an advocate for the organization. I know I gave that, that example as well, um, you know, encouraging them to attend, uh, you know, attend client events. Um, I know, uh, you know, in-person events aren't, uh, aren't, aren't happening uh, still as much, unfortunately. A lot of our clients' events are, are still virtual. Um, but that opens up some initial, you know, some additional possibilities as well. You know, we've had, um, you know, clients here in, uh, you know, again, just, you know, here in the Philadelphia area and in Pennsylvania where um, because their events were forced to go virtual, they've been able to, to reach a far larger audience than they would have otherwise with, with an in-person event. But, um, you know, in terms of, of, of your banker, again, it's all about relationships, right? We always talk about, you know, building those relationships, cultivating those relationships. And it's, uh, you know, it's just a, you know, a matter of, uh, you know, needing to get together, you know, the, the, the client that I mentioned where, um, you know, we found that the, the, the president of that organization, uh, you know, shared a common interest with my client. They had the, the, the same passion for, for, animal, for animal welfare. Um, that individual has now, um, you know, connected my client with other potential funders as well, but has also, you know, built a relationship with us at YPTC where, you know, we've met with them. We've discussed, um, you know, how can we, uh, you know, how can we um, you know, get you connected with other organizations and other nonprofits that we serve, and maybe not even in in bank. You know, we talk about banking, but it goes um, really far beyond that into other financial services as well. I know it's probably getting beyond certainly what we would have time for today, but um, you know, investment management and insurance as well. You know, there's there is that whole suite of financial services and products that um, that are available to to organizations today. Okay, Bill, now curveball. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. So let's go back to your um, nonprofit. You've got, you know, banking relationship. They're getting excited. That's the CEO of a bank, high profile leader. That's the type of board member that you want because you know they're going to attract other interest, attention, and hopefully dollars. Would that be a conflict of interest to have that banker who, if they are doing business with that organization, sit on that board? Um, it wouldn't necessarily be. Now, of course, we always want to make sure all of our organizations have, have, a, have a conflict of interest policy and something that, um, you know, it's not something you, you sign once and, and you put in a drawer. You know, the right. best policy is one you're reviewing. And, and I know, you know, for, for my clients, you know, the, the board members need to, to certify that on, on an annual basis. Um, I want to go back to, um, I, I think I had opened talking about the PPP loan, right? So, um, you know, I have a client where, you know, the their their board treasurer uh you know is is the controller at uh at one of at, at their local bank that they use and it was the bank where they got their ppp loan from now this individual had nothing to do with that completely of course recused themselves from the from the process but still in the interest of transparency you know we made sure you know is that in you know doesn't violate any conflict of interest and it's disclosed right if you read that organization's 990 you're going to see mentioned right in there Hey, the organization, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but basically the, um, the board treasurer is also an employee at the bank where this organization obtained its PPP loan, you know, and had nothing to do with the decision or the loan making process. Right. And well, that's I, great practice across the board. It could be, you know, a real estate person. It could be an attorney. It could be a marketing professional. You know, there's so many ways in which our board members help to provide additional services. And you're right to have that conflict of interest to recuse yourself as a board member from those voting. Um, great, great best practice that you mentioned. Before we went live, Bill, you mentioned that there is um, a worksheet or a toolkit or something you said, you're like, it's all out there for everyone to access um, on the YPT website. Uh, what, what exactly is out there and how do we access that? 
Oh, in terms, so in terms of resources, now these aren't going to be specifically related to banking, but I know, um, I know when Jennifer Oliva was on yesterday, she mentioned our, our mission business uh, podcast series, which is, which is fantastic. I think the, uh, the latest episode uh, was, is in post-production right now. So stay tuned. That's going to, going to be out soon. But um, if you go to uh, YPTC's website, and it's just YPTC, YPTC.com, um, there's a ton of information there, but there's a tab called resources. And if you go in there, um, you know, that is chock full of, of every, you know, webinar that we did, every article that we put out related to, to PPP when that happened, the employee retention credit, tons of other uh, resources. And that, I mean, we made the conscious decision to, to make that freely available to, to everyone, regardless, you know, you, whether you're a client of ours or not. Yeah. Yep. I, I think that's what's really cool. Is that Very helpful. You do not have to be a client of YPTC. Obviously, they hope you are. <laughs> but with the more than 1000 plus clients, um, you know, yeah, it's open. And it's uh, very interesting information, because I find, Bill, that it um, is done in language that, that non-finance people can understand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super important. We don't have a lot of time left, but I want to get into one more aspect of the banking relationship and having banking in your boat. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of that strategic thinking, like, um, you know, everything from lines of credit to maybe managing portfolios. You know, as you mentioned, the charters have changed in the last 10 years and banks can now have those types of um, service lines and insurance lines and things that they never could before. What does that look like? Yeah, it, it really is or, or can be kind of that in, entire suite of, uh, of sort of services under one roof. Now, whether that makes sense for an organization or not, obviously that, that decision is going to vary on a, on a case by case uh, basis. But absolutely, you know, you want to be having, uh, you know, those conversations, you know, are the, are the bank products you're using, your checking account, your savings account, you know, is it, uh, you know, are they best suited to your, to your organization? It might be something as simple simple as, um, and I know, you know, interest rates aren't terribly high right now, so you're not going to make a huge return on your money, but hey, should our, you know, our, our, our save, you know, is there a, a, a higher rate we can get on our savings account or make this checking account an interest bearing account? So that at least we're, we're earning a little bit of return on it because every extra dollar you're getting in interest income is another dollar you can put into the mission uh, of the organization. And, and certainly what are, um, you know, what are the loan offerings of, of that organization? You know, if you don't have a line of credit, definitely have that, have that conversation because it's far better, um, you know, to have the line and, never have to use it than to not have the line and, and find you wish you were in a, in a position that you, that you need it. Um, investing, I mean, we could probably spend, uh, you know, we could, we could spend a whole session just on investing and, and then some and, and, and barely scratch the surface. Um, but of course, you know, investing for, for, for nonprofits is huge for any organization that, you know, has an endowment or, or just has some funds that they, you know, want to, to set aside for future use in the organization, you know, so there's, um, there's a whole suite of, 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 of services that that banks and financial advisors could offer in that realm in terms of of helping you know helping an organization craft their investment policy statement and then what's their what's their spending policy you know how are you gonna gonna spend those assets and if it's an endowment of course making sure it's it's complying with with all the different rules that that exist for for um, you know making sure you're uh, not drawing too much but also at the same time not drawing too little because the goal is you know that endowment is there to to support an organization. Um, you know, I once had um, a client board member say to me, you know, in a way, our, our endowment is our organization's biggest contributor. And, and I had never thought about it that way. But I, I said, you know what, I said, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it's, it's gifts that were made in prior years. But those are gifts that, you know, obviously, but since the organization is prudently investing they continue to pay dividends to that organization long after that that original gift was made. And, and again, partnering with the right organization to, to help manage that is critical. Amazing. I'm so yeah. glad you mentioned endowment. I've heard um, of organizations really focusing on that, especially in lieu of, maybe not in lieu, but especially because of COVID, really making sure that, you know, there is 
um, an endowment or some kind of like security fund. And I'm also hearing, Bill, a lot of organizations dipping their toe and considering capital campaigns. And that's another great opportunity, you know, that you really want to make sure that you do have a banker in your boat because that is going to take a little bit more handholding and relationship for the longevity. You know, most capital campaigns, three to five years um, in length, or those pledges might stretch out to about five years. So having that relationship uh, with your banking institute is really important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Bill, it's been great to have you with us and our time is almost up, but I've got one quick question. And this is kind of a little bit of a nuanced question, but it seems to me that when you go into any branch or you, you go online and you look at the bank's you know, service lines, they have very specific, you know, this is what it costs. This is what you know, the fees are. This is how we structure it. Is it realistic to think that as a nonprofit, we can ask for a better rate or get a better deal or have some sort of consideration? You absolutely can ask um, and you should ask, right? Always ask for that, that better deal. And I will tell you for, um, you know, again, for, for, the, for the banks that are out there that are making a, um, a concerted effort to, to really market themselves to the nonprofit sector, I think you will find um, in many cases, um, you know, a, a deeply discounted or at least reduced fees that are that are offered to, to the nonprofit sector. So you absolutely should be on the lookout and 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 taking advantage of them where it makes sense. Yeah. OK, that's like the best news of the day, <laughs> don't you think, Jared? That is very important. Even, you know, wiring funds or something like that, there's typically a $30 fee or, you know, there's there's always a fee on top of something. So anytime, as you said, Bill, you can make sure that that dollar goes towards your mission and maybe not bank fees. That's a better, better place for the mission for sure. Yeah. Great news. Love it. Well, Bill, this has been great. I love this conversation. It's one of those things that it's at the heart of how we perform our financial health, and yet something we don't talk enough about unless we've had a problem or we don't have a relationship. And to quote the nonprofit nerd, it's all about that return on relationship, the ROR. Here's Bill's information. Um, Philadelphia manager extraordinaire coming to us from the East Coast today. We have been so honored that you would come and talk to us about bankers in our boat establishing relationships. Um, it's such a critical topic and one that I think as we go more and more towards, you know, digital banking, it's going to, going to become that much more important. And so um, this was a great conversation to have. Bill mentioned uh, Mission Business, a new podcast that YPTC is doing. Here's the information about it. Check it out. It's really a cool opportunity to get um, information about what's going on in the current ecosystem um, from the wide range of talent that YPTC has. I mean, unfortunately, we only have a week with your organization and we have five different voices every day coming in uh, is a different view. That's really a lot of fun. So check and them we'll, out on this. We will. Anytime you want us back, we'll, we'll be thrilled to be here. <laughs> well, we, we have had, you know, man, I'm telling you, when, this, for, when we first started, we had Jennifer, your managing partner on speed dial. And that poor woman, <laughs> we were just like, what are we, we doing? We definitely had her in our boat. That's for sure. We were we in the same boat, not quite sure where, which way we were rowing, but we were in it together. <laughs> that because oh. Jennifer was in our boat and uh, she touched a lot of nonprofits across this country um, because yeah. everybody was worried about what was going to go on and it was changing moment by moment. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. More importantly, she's the nonprofit nerd, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors that have been with us day in and day out and that are so gracious to support these amazing conversations that we get to have. You know, Jarrett and I, at one point we thought, are we gonna run out of things to talk about? And that has just not happened, has it, Jarrett? I mean, it's not. there's so much and we have so much going through. We're virtually booked up for the rest of the year with one entertaining and interesting guest after another. So again, our sponsors make that possible. 
Now this is Nonprofit Power Week. And so I wanna just make sure before we um, sign off and let you get to the real work of the day, we've got really interesting discussions. Yesterday we had um, fraud in nonprofits. We've got financial best practices for boards, remote accounting, how that actually works. Bill touched on some of that today. And then our ask and answer all Friday, um, Friday is um, going to be all about accounting. So that's going to be a lot of fun. If you missed an episode, certainly you can catch it on our archive. Wow, another great episode. Jarrett, I learned a lot. Oh, me too. And this, you have an affinity for financial institutions, Julia. So we didn't share that with you, Bill, but Julia yeah. really knows her stuff when it comes to financials. And um, I've learned so much and it's been wonderful. So thank you for sharing your time, talents and expertise with us, Bill. We are so grateful. We're so grateful to have YPTC joining us this week to bring all of you a power week. So make sure that you join us. Uh, if you missed yesterday's conversation with Jennifer, you can find that on the archive and stay tuned because tomorrow we'll be back. Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. And as we end another wonderful episode of the nonprofit show, Power Week, we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. See you back here tomorrow, everybody.